Welcome. Yeah, I'm doing the talk tonight, and Leah is uh, introducing me. You might need the microphone if you don't. I don't. Sebastian, have you ever taken one of my spoken word workshops? I should. I think so. Yeah. Why don't you just use this as you would any other night? Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. You do. Oh, I got it. Well, not yet. <laughs> that sounds great. Oh. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's a theater thing. Uh, yeah, the honeymooners. So, welcome to the University of Chicago in Paris. Um, Lydia is coming here for the like fifteenth time, maybe. Um, she's always welcome, and we have more and more people coming every year. The good thing is that there are plenty of new people, so I can recycle my annual introduction, so I don't have to, because I'm lazy. Good idea. <laughs> so Lydia is often introduced by people who say, the only way to define the art of Lydia is simply not to. That's, uh, and then they go on talking 20 minutes uh, so I, about her art. <laughs> so I will remain brief and simple. I, I first saw Lydia Lunch live when I was like 19 or 20 years old in 1988, a few hundred meters from here, just at the border of the old 13th arrondissement. We're in the new 13th arrondissement, in case you didn't notice on your way here. On Rue du Noir, the theater of the same name, it was this old railroad tracks of these old abandoned warehouses, the usual old building with artists. She was doing a spoken word show, something which appeared strange to me and fascinating at the same time. The audience, since we're in France, was warned that no music would be played, and that's sort of what you expect in a spoken word show, but they were still warned that there would be no music, and that it would be in English. These two facts, knowing Paris at the time, should have already emptied the room, but there were a few people, just about the same amount. Lydia, enough! Enough. For <laughs> I don't mean for me, but I mean <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. No, no. Oh, no, I got it. I got it. I do understand jokes. Uh, <laughs> Lydia, came, <laughs> Lydia came with Henry Va Rollins of Black Flag fame. The show was incredible. Henry did his hilarious stand-up comedy show, so the people were all relaxed and ready for more fun. And then it was time for Lydia to come on stage, and she just murdered everyone. There were no prisoners were taken. If only I really have. <laughs> it was terror in the room. Even the ones who did not speak any English were scared. Imagine the ones who did. I was cautiously in the back. The, the room was small, so I didn't miss anything. <laughs> but I decided on the same evening that I would never miss a Lydia show, whatever form it would be. And believe me, there were they have been many in the last 30 years. I mean, I didn't see all of them, but I, I did see quite a few. Lydia is, is, I, is, is she's, uh, she's what? She's a performer. She's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's, of course, a singer. She plays the guitar. She's a writer. She's a po spoken word artist, as you'll see tonight. She's a poet. She's a photographer. Pornographer. A pornographer, <laughs> which you will also see tonight. No, you won't. <laughs> um, she always collaborates with wonderful people. I'll mention James Johnston first because he's in the room. Oh, hey. Hey. <laughs> Um, and Greg Foreman. And, well, and Greg Foreman, but I didn't know he was coming, so he's not written. But, and Greg Foreman! Oh, <laughs> and various other scouts. Yeah, well, see, that's the part that's really interesting, is that Lydia often works with people when they're still interesting. So that's why she stopped working with people back, with Nick Cave back in 82. And uh, when and she worked with Michael Gerard. Actually, may I interrupt? Yes. The reason I stopped working with Nick Cave was twofold. First of all, he never understood a thing I did or said. Second of all, after the third time of saving him from overdosing, I said, that's enough. Carry on. <laughs> and besides that. Well, we can, we can talk about the oh, Sonic Youth people my... back in 84. I mean, all these people, 30 years ago. That's why I mentioned James Johnston first, because he was working with you up to about a month ago. So and he was actually, that's a good sign. And actually, he's so good, we're all weeping for the loss. Well, he's not dead. No, I know, but he's painting and not rocking. But his paintings rock, so what are they going to do? Kind of everything. And well, yes, you do. Thanks to Lydia, I discovered wonderful, also wonderful writers. And Lydia writes, reads all the time. She always says, I discovered Hubert Selby, Harry Cruz. I mean, things that people I would have never read if I had, she hadn't told me. Of, well, I didn't, I didn't know her at the time, but if I had not known, she was reading them. Uh, Lydia is really afraid of nothing. She can play in dirty punk rock clubs like last weekend. 
and pull a drunk guy by his hair on stage because he's being an idiot. Did I? Well, not last weekend, but it didn't even happen. I've seen it happen. That's the least of Or she can come here in this fancy room and talk to a few University of Chicago students. And others. Well, there are none of them tonight, but she could. If they, <laughs> they know better. But, well, they're actually not there yet. <laughs> this year hasn't started. So I'm very honored to have her again. I'd like to thank my employer, the University of Chicago, who allows me to do things like that. Maybe because I they don't really know. I try to consider know. them my personal banker, but if only they'd add an extra zero after every time I appear. And tonight she's going to be reading parts of her book. And other things. And other things. And I am going to, I'm going to shut up right now and thank Lydia again for being with us. And, Glad to be uh, here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sebastian, a few people have been telling me that I need to calm down. I think I'll take that. They like asking me, why do you have to be so raunchy, so aggressive, so insistent, so violent? And here's where I draw the line. Violent? I mean, please. Now, I have been known to occasionally slap a bitch or a bitch boy, sometimes more than 50 times, but only when they requested I do so in order to erase usually their father's fist from their face. The same way that I occasionally have used cock to erase my father's cock from my face. What I don't get is how in this day and age people are becoming so incredibly fucking precious. I just don't get it. I mean, I, I really don't understand. I mean, like, I don't sweat the small shit. All right, I have a corrosive bloodline. Let's just consider Sicilian, German, and American as something that boils within you. In other words, every day in my life I'm fighting a triple fascismo that is not of my own making. That's fine, but I don't sweat the small shit. So for instance, if somebody grabs my ass, who wouldn't want to? It's a fucking ass, everybody's got one. Somebody grabs my ass, and I don't like it, usually I do. It's very simple to just grab their fucking nutsack and twist, right? Somebody cat calls me on the street, and I don't like what I'm hearing, it's real easy to just walk up real quiet, real serious, and whisper in their ear. I could fucking kill you with a throat punch. That is after I crack your fucking dick. <laughs> now ladies, if you need a little lesson on how to crack a dick, it's pretty simple. You sit on it, you go far to the left as fast as possible, and I can assure you that within two or three minutes, that thing's gonna size, swell to the size of an eggplant. They're gonna be in the emergency room sitting on a fucking ice pack for 24 hours. Ain't gonna be no more insistence in doing shit you don't wanna fucking do now, is there? I do get a bit violent, mostly verbally violent, because I don't have a fucking enough ammunition. When I hear about, for instance, Mexican mothers now burying their daughters alive in the desert to prevent them, that might assure sainthood, to prevent them from becoming the possible victims of a drug cartel, whether they like it or not, and might be then vivisected and left in the fucking desert to rot. Now, I do get a bit violent when I hear every fucking day pathological lies from a predator on Pennsylvania Avenue, that would be the White House, whose only immigrants he has any respect for are the ones he can fuck. And in the meantime, he separates women and children in cages as if it's a fucking Nazi gulag on the border of Mexico, which are not our enemies, by the way, they are our neighbors. We should have no enemies. Freedom and liberty for all, but fucking shit. I do get a bit violent, verbally, of course. Again, I wish I would have fucking met him myself. Billionaire, pedophiles. Now imagine me. I'm kind of a pedophile in reverse. When I was 13, I was a predator to older men. So imagine if I could have met that billionaire pedophile, Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. Somebody that sells into sexual slavery dozens if not hundreds of girls, to presidents, princes of state, 
heads have stayed. I would like all their fucking heads on the cutting block. And what I would have taught those other girls, those young girls, is how to crack a motherfucking dick. That could have ended the story quite quickly. And ladies, I'm not exaggerating when I say any sack of nuts, I don't care how big they are. And excuse me, because I am vulgar. You do that, pretty much it's over. Now, unless somebody has a gun to your head, and not many people have guns in this country, that's why I keep one under my fucking pillow in America, because we need to. Unless somebody has a gun to your head, it is really pretty simple to rip out a sack of balls. Do that, squash or crack a fucking dick, and the story could be quickly ended. I just wish mothers would teach their daughters. And in France, it's very important because this is the only country I know of, and I've been to a few, where I've heard of six women I know getting raped in the fucking streets of Paris. I think it's very important for mothers to teach their daughters by the age of six. Their head is level to the head of a dick. How to fucking headbutt. How to grab a sack of nuts. How to not tolerate. How to be able to physically, psychically, spiritually, and verbally defend yourself from the predation we know is all around and it is not new and the Me Too movement did not fucking start it and I don't want real violence and trauma and rape to be reduced to somebody grabbing my fucking ass because if I don't like that, trust me, I'm gonna give them a fucking throat punch. Now, when people tell me to calm down, I think it's time for other people to fucking rise up, not for me to calm down. Just saying, I am calm. You wanna see me when I'm riled up? Mm. I'm Lydia Lunch. Thank you for coming out to the University of Chicago, Paris. Thank you. Let me take you back a bit. Because you got to know how I got this way, right? I was born, huh? Might be the only person you know who was actually a natural born killer. I'll talk about that later, maybe. I hit Manhattan, that is New York City, as a teen terror in 1976, inspired by the manic ravings of Lester Bangs and Cream Magazine. The Velvet Underground, Sarcastic Wit, and The Glamour of the New York Dolls, first album. I snuck out of my bedroom window, jumped on a Greyhound bus, and crash-landed in a bigger ghetto than the one I had just escaped from. But with 200 bucks in my back pocket and a scratch book full of misanthropic ranting, sporting a baby face which belied a hustler's instinct and a killer urge to destroy everything that had inspired me, I didn't really give a flying fuck if the Bowery smelled like dog shit. I wasn't expecting the toilets at CBGB's to be the bookend to Duchamp's urinal, but then again, maybe 1977 had more in common with 1917 than anybody had ever imagined. Now, New York City during the 1970s and early 80s was a beautifully ravaged, slag, impoverished, and neglected after suffering from decades of abuse and battery. New York stunk of sex and drugs and aerosol paint. Her breath hung heavy, a sweet tubercular, sticky and vicious. She leaked from every pore like a sexy corpse, unable to give up the ghost, a succubus that fed on new meat and fresh blood, which in turn suckled on her like greedy parasites, uh, alchemizing her putrefaction into a breeding ground of intoxicating fauna. It was like a contaminated nursery overrun with toxic belladonna, a deadly nightshade whose blossoms mocked death by embracing a life which defied death, which in turn mocked everything else. Now long before the family, friendly gentrification, a capital gang criminality which whitewashed New York City of all its kaleidoscopic perversions in order to make it safe for anyone who could afford the ridiculous rents charged for shoebox-sized apartments. The Lower East Side played crash pad, shooting gallery, and bordello to dozens of art school dropouts, avant noise musicians, radical poets, and no-budget filmmakers. We all lived within spitting distance of each other in tenement flats. It was a drug-fueled, no-holes-barred, blood-soaked pornucopia of art terrorists documenting their personal descent into the bowels of an inferno in a city which felt like the lunatics, and trust me, they had taken over the asylum. I feel that creativity acts as a rogue virus, spontaneously combusting, splattering the brain matter of its host carrier across a finite terrain for a fleeting moment of time, forever staining the landscape. Hippie radicals flock to San Francisco's Haight-Asbury during the summer of love, seeking revolution before the acid wore off. 
heavyweight Southern African Americans migrated north looking for a paid work and ended up singing the blues in Chicago in the 1940s. The devil hollered when he caught his great balls of fire in Memphis throughout the 1950s. The scandalous theatrics and outrageous decadence of German, Germany's Weimar Republic in the 1920s fostered both an uprising prostitution and performance art. Just check out Anita Berber, please do. And it made the golden age of Hollywood in the dirty 30s seem quaint by comparison. The boisterous orgy that had begun in Andy Warhol's factory in the swinging 60s had become a bloated technicolor corpse, kicked to the curb by gutter punks and no wave nihilists in the late 70s, who I, whose idea of a good time was defined by how much noise we could make, how much art we could create, and how much trouble we could have before the cops showed up to shut down the after party. Like the anti-art invasion of Dada and the surrealist pranksters who shadowed them, we had a blast pissing off everybody and all of their expectations of what art was. No way, which I still consider myself to be in any format that I create in, no wave was a collective bowel cleansing catarol, which spat forth a collective of extreme artists who defied category, despised convention, defiled the audience, refused to compromise, and has consequently influenced and informed pop culture as well as mainstream media ever since. Now it's only a movement in retrospect. Post Alan Vega's pre-punk two-piece appropriately named Suicide, of which I am now doing a tribute to, and before the pop-punk grunge of Sonic Youth, New York City was the devil's dirty litter box. No Wave was, and still is, the bastard offspring of Taxi Driver, Times Square, the Son of Sam, the Blackout of 1977, the dud of the Summer of Love, the hate fuck of Charles Manson, the hell of the Vietnam War of Kent State, and the Kennedy assassinations. It was a mad collective of death-defiant miscreants, desperate, to rebel against the absolutely apathetic complacency of a zombie nation that would be the USA dumbed down by sitcoms, disco, fast food, and professional wrestling. Yes, we were angry, ugly, snotty, and loud, still am. We use music and art as a battering ram in a form of psychic self-defense against our own naturally violent tendencies an extreme reaction against everything the 1960s had promised but failed to deliver. A collective mania shot through the night skies of a decade riddled with the aftermath of all the failures and frustrations that had come before it. But beneath the scowls of derision and the antagonism and acrimony, the beautifully hideous harangues and the nearly unbearable shrill that was the grotesque soundtrack of our lives, we were all howling with delight. We were laughing like fucking lunatics at the brink of the apocalypse in a madhouse the size of all of New York City. We were thrilled to be rubbing up against the freaks and outcasts who somehow, for some reason, had all decided to run to Land's End and all at once scream their bloody heads off. Now that's what no wave was. But there's a story that comes before that. Well, this is for Greg because well, I'm going to sing a few songs in this one from 1967. This piece is called 1967. And I was asked to write it for Wire magazine. They usually have people write a story like their favorite album, their favorite song or book. Well, I decided to write about my favorite year. And I was eight years old. And this is the story about that. And I think that's actually when the inspiration for me to do what I do hit. Blood buckets down the undulating walls. Invisible fists rage with superhuman strength and hammer the door. The ancient wood frame buckles, crumples, and heaves. The empty nursery reverberates with the mournful howl of a pitiful infant who cannot be located. I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor, clutching my throat, trembling, dry-mouthed, unable to breathe. The haunting of Hill House, which by now is a fantastic Netflix special based on the Shirley Jackson book of the same name, little relation to the Netflix, a lot of relation to the film, absolutely terrifying. The Haunting of Hill House is the most terrifying movie I've ever seen. I'm eight years old. A suffocating humidity saturates the night air. Static electricity vibrates the hair follicles. The low buzzing hum of the black and white Motorola TV is swallowed up in the wheezing yelp of a 
stray dog which bellows like town crier somewhere in someone's backyard. His hairy yapping immediately mimicked and amplified by every mutt in the neighborhood and around Robin of barks and howls. A desperate warning cry which signals the coming maelstrom. The atmosphere stiffens. The dogs retreat. Time bends. In a sudden explosion of white noise, hundreds of frenzied voices shrieking out of nowhere, as if all hell's fury in a sudden explosion from Middle Earth materializes, compounding my terror. Men, women, and their children who have been hoisted upon their shoulders of older brothers are all shouting slogans in a demonic gospel fever. Equal pay, equal work. We're black and proud. Say it loud. Black power, we're here to stay. The riots of 1967 have deterred down Clifford Avenue and are stampeding directly in front of my house. Hammers, baseball bats, pipes and bricks all employed in the demolition of cars, windows, storefronts. A hideous industrial opera of unbearable din. My father chain smokes and paces, unleashing a litany of curses. He punches the air in his best Marlon Brando as his station wagon crumbles under the endless battery of physical abuse. The ambulance and fire trucks barrel in, splitting the angry throng in two, their sirens a deafening symphony, which exaggerate the cacophony. Police helicopters circle the periphery, giant mechanical insects whose diabolical hum blankets the shrill. My fear, what with the movie and now the riots, is drowned in sound, but is reborn by joy and flames. The family car is set on fire. I start to laugh maniacally to dance, to sing, come on baby, light my fire, try to set the night on fire. My father assumes I've lost my mind, and against my insistent protest, sends me to my room. I skulk upstairs, dejected, kind of a drag, mumbled under my breath. A noise, a rebellion, a violence, clanging, pounding, exciting, and I'm locked out. I can't really comprehend what's happening, but it feels right. I mean, I'm no longer frightened. I'm charged up. I'm zoning into the collective urgency, the passion, the determination. I head to the attic, my hidden retreat, turn on the radio. Top 40 in 1967 was insane. White Rabbit, Jefferson Airplane, Seven Rooms of Gloom, Funky Broadway, Hunter Gets Captured by the Game, Are You Experienced by Jimi Hendrix, Back to Back. I mean, I had no idea what any of these songs were referencing or what they really meant or how subversive they really were. I used the radio to disappear, to escape from my family, to enter another dimension, to melt inside a psychedelic soundscape, like which cascaded out through the airwaves, thrilling my already fractured psyche with a throbbing, slinky, funkified soul music where soaring rhythms and strangled guitars took me out of myself and gave me goosebumps. I wake up in a cold sweat, stimulated me in ways I could only express by shaking my ass, flapping my arms, and stomping my feet. Jimmy Lee Johnson, no relation to James Johnson, that's Jimmy Lee Johnson, the seven-year-old black boy next door, skinny legs and all, had the entire James Brown drop down to one knee and use his sweatshirt as a cape routine down path. It's the first time anyone really flirted with me. I was amazed by his mimicry, his fluidity, his tiny body, body gliding through the air with so much passion and control. He really knew how to shake a tail feather. He must have caught James Brown on the Ed Sullivan Show. Everybody was glued to the tube on Sunday nights. The Rolling Stones doing Let's Spend the Night Together, the Animals, George Carlin, all penetrated my unformed psyche courtesy of Mr. Ed Sullivan. Even the infamous Doors controversy where Jim Morrison refused to change I know we couldn't get my child. Subsequently banning him and the doors from future appearances struck a raw nerve in my adolescent conscience. Music is the connective tissue between protest, rebellion, violence, sexual awareness, and community. It's just the way it is. This was the summer of love. What a fucking lie. Reagan was elected governor of California. Lyndon B. Johnson increased troop presence in Vietnam, ignoring the massive demonstrations which 
rocked the nightly news. There were 70,000 people in New York City protesting. Race riots stormed through Cleveland, Detroit, Watts, Birmingham, Alabama, Rochester, New York, and hundreds of other U.S. cities in flaming tensions. Muhammad Ali was stripped of his World Heavyweight Championship for refusing to go into the draft. Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys wouldn't go to war either and got tied up in a five-year legal battle, which he eventually won. The Boston Strangler was sentenced to life in prison and escaped from the institution he was held at. I think that terrified me more than any of the above. Bread was 22 cents a loaf. A gallon of gas was 28 cents, and the inner city ghetto, which I call home, was brimming with hardworking people with attitude and conviction, whose lust for life couldn't be beaten out of them by piss poor housing conditions, lousy pay, the police, or politicians. They taught me to fight for what I believe in, to take pride in what I did, to never give up, keep the faith, and when hoping for a better tomorrow just isn't enough to turn up the music and dance them damn blues away. Well, as the saying goes, you can take the wigger out of the ghetto, but you cannot take the ghetto out of the wigger. And I am a wigger. And after all, the world is a ghetto. And even though I'll never forget my roots, I refuse to allow them to strangle me by the ankles because even if I had to beg, borrow, and steal, this lightning's girl was going to be sure she was making every minute count, just like the radio taught me. 1967 helped to define who I was to become. I may have been too young to fully grasp the political implications of the time, but it started a fire in my belly that burns as bright today as it ever did. The National Organization of Women was officially incorporated in 1967. Grace Slick and Janis Joplin both, both threw down at the Monterey Pop Festival. Shirley Temple ran for Congress. I was just a tiny terror screaming my bloody head off to Fungi Broadway, but I was already planning my big city escape. I knew by the time I was nine what I had to do, and that's what I'm doing now. Oh, my. I feel like a gospel piece coming on now. In my time of, I'm not dying. How times have changed. Let's get this fast straight. The mass neurotic triad of insufferable idiocy, infantile narcissism, an internet addiction has fostered a spiritual bankruptcy and an existential vacuum, a moral coma. I think we're suffering from a culture in crisis where all meaning has been leached from real life and replaced with reality TV. Who the fuck is sitting in the White House? A reality TV star. Just saying. Kiss my ass, Kim Kardashian, you overblown tool. For having created a cult of celebrity devoid of talent and integrity whose only value is net worth generated by catering to the lowest common denominator. And you know, and we all know exactly what that is. A dumbed down society where everyone's a star baby circling around a galaxy formed by a black hole which centers around their own fucking asshole. I'm not a fucking star, I'm not a rock star. Call me what you will, don't call me that shit. Excuse me, back to the point. This is all just a non-stop circus sideshow littered with a big titted half-wits pandering to dopey dicks as the theater of the ridiculous plays out 24 hours a fucking day. I hate you fucking Kim Kardashian. You know what? I hate all your fucking selfies, your Instagrams, your internet, your Facebook book. I don't even do my own. He does my Facebook. That's right. Just saying. May I repeat? It's a non-stop circus sideshow litter with a big tit, and I have big tits, but at least I still have half the fucking brain. Pandering to the dopey dicks as the theater of the ridiculous plays out 24 hours a day in perfect rotation. A pathetic ploy that pulls the brain-dead public into spying on somebody else's petty life so that they can forget just how much they are being spied on and manipulated into becoming a victim of the surveillance state. A pawn in the game who willingly gives up. And you have all willingly given up your own fucking privacy. If you don't think you're being spied on, think again. In order to play Patsy on a public platform modeling your fucking dirty laundry in an unending series of senseless selfies. I hate you and I hate your fucking selfies too. Let's just get that out there. That's all need to be said. Just saying. My next manifesto, now that I mentioned her, the Kardashians. 
My next manifesto, not written yet, is going to be to take the 10 most high-profiled and richest celebutards and tell us all exactly what we could do without fucking money. So in other words, you got $26 million to spend on a fucking mansion, you could wipe out half the debt of Peru. Coming soon, trust me on that. Let's change the subject, shall we? Thank you very much. Cheers. Hi, Sebastian. Uh. Okay, let's just calm down. Calm down! Oh, you think I don't tell myself that on a daily basis? No, I don't. Rise up! Charlie said that would be Manson. He said one thing, right, Rise? You know, what I really want, well, what I want is more of everything, always. What I really want is a sacred space, a secret place, a magical, non-tragic existence where words and music flow like the blood of a matador gourd by the most beautiful bull that the world has never taken the time to witness. What I want, really all I want is uninterrupted, hedonistic bliss before the final kiss, which will probably come up well for most of you too fucking soon anyway, but I mean, I'm 60, I'm still alive, I ain't gonna know where that's true. What I want, and what I do get, I'm insistent on this, is pure intoxication as I lose my mind. So I don't have to think about the insanity of men who would rather murder somebody else than to imagine me fucking and having a good goddamn time and I will fucking have a good goddamn time. What I want is for you to be free. What I want is for everybody else to be more like me, to be free of misery and bullshit and agony and self-doubt, to be laughing like a lunatic, both middle fingers, flying in the face of fuckers who matter or not, and if all this is just too damn hard, then please just leave the fuck now. Thank you very much. Will you write it? Of course not going to. Why would you be too embarrassed? Hi, I'm Lydia Lange. Yeah. All right. This is for the ghosts. It's for the ghosts. It's for the dead and dying. It's for the war-torn and battle fatigue. It's for the widows and orphans of warriors. It's for the warriors. It's for the warriors who are willing to die fighting for their belief, who are willing to die fighting for what they believed in because they felt it was better to die fighting for freedom than to live a life enslaved by lies. And this is for those who believe. And you better believe. You better believe in ghosts. You better believe in ghosts because you too will soon enough become a ghost. This is for the ghosts of Fallujah, Anbar Province, Abu Ghraib, Bakuba, Guantanamo, Gaza, Beirut, Baghdad, Kabul, Kandahar, Jalalabad, Islamabad, Kathmandu, Mogadishu, Darfur, Sierra Leone, Yemen, all of Syria, Libya, Jordan, Gaza, all ghosts made by American intervention. This is for the freedom fighters. This is for the freedom fighters. This is for the insurgents. It's for the rebels and rabble rousers and for every individual who fights against tyranny and oppression. It's for the martyrs. It's for the martyrs from Mohamed Mossadegh, Salvador Allende, Oscar Romero, Teo Van Gogh, Federico Garcia Lorca, Pasolini, Bruno Schultz, Madeline Marie O'Hare, one of my favorites, and if you are American, you better know about her. I suggest the 1969 Playboy interview with her. She is a woman who was singularly the most hated woman in America before I came along, got rid of prayer in school. Madeline Marie O'Hare. It's for the wounded. It's for the wounded and traumatized. It's for the survivors. This is for those suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, which I feel like I am suffering from every day of my goddamn life. This is for those that choose to survive and strive to overcome the roadblocks and landmines, the pitfalls and setbacks, the negativity of a world which forces you to fight tooth and nail, forces you into battle mode on a daily basis just so you can maintain a tenuous grip on your own sanity after a lifetime of the enemy's bullshit, torture, humiliation, brainwashing, and abuse. It's for the ghosts of Brooklyn, the Bronx, Philadelphia, 
Detroit, Watts, Englewood, Oakland, St. Louis, New Orleans, Memphis, Stratton, Youngstown, Cleveland, Camden, Baltimore, Newark, Little Rock, Tulsa, Baton Rouge, etc., etc., etc. This is for the ghosts who feel they were born invisible to life, born into a war zone of poverty and desperation, and, or as I am in a neglect in a country which glamorizes violence, worships serial killers, threatens by massacre, and then arrogantly brags about gangbanging the whole fucking world. It's for the lovers, for the lovers of forgetfulness. And oh, I would like, these are not my ghosts, but they fucking haunt me. It's for the lovers of forgetfulness, who turn a blind eye to all those who have been murdered fighting somebody else's battle, fighting for you to be free. Most of all, this is for my ghost. It's for my ghost. And trust me, my ghost will be as loud in death as it has been in life, because I've already fucking said it all. Just take a breath. Take a breath. Or a drink. Anybody need a drink? Yes, can you give those ladies a drink some action, please? <laughs> give them a drink and a tissue for the next one. No, just give them a drink. Anybody needs a drink, you can have a drink. You'll have to deliver some action. I'm sorry, you'll have to be the cocktail girl. Let them take a breath. This one is going to hurt in a different way. In my high time of dying, I don't want nobody to mourn. All I want for you to do is to take my body home. In my time of dying, blues and rocks do what I can do. I don't want nobody to cry. All I want for you to do is to take me when I die. Well, 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 I'm not dying. Shouldn't we? But other people are. We all know people that are dead or dying. So I wrote this eulogy. I'm from a place very close to what was the first Superfund site. If anybody knows what that is, in America there's 1900 Superfund super sites and that's a no-go, do not live, toxic zone. So there's been a lot of death in my family, early death. My mother had 11 brothers and sisters, three lived to adulthood. My mother had a miscarriage before, after I had a dead twin with me, my sister had birth defects. I had three cousins die of brain cancer, okay? This is for the last two that died of brain cancer. I had cancer five times, well that ain't nothing against cancer to me, it's just what we all get, it's how you deal with it. What would you say to somebody who only has 30 days to live? I mean, what can you say? You say that in this land of illusion, we're all just transitional creatures. We're all just peeping toms at the keyhole of all eternity. That the past is only the present cloaked by invisibility and that the future is just a murmur of a memory we will never possess. That the great mystery is not that we were thrown down here at random between the profusion of matter and that of the stars, but that from our fleshy prison, we have created images powerful enough to deny our nothingness. I don't know about you, but I have tried to force my words into the mouth of the universe. It's a giant black hole turned inside out with tales full of sound and fury, madness and lust, but in the end you have to say what well, they're signifying. What the hell are they signifying? I mean, we inhabit an insignificant planet, orbiting a minor star lost in a galaxy, tucked away in a forgotten corner of a, an unfathomable expanse. We come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars, hoping that one day, one day over the distant horizon lies an incredible lightness of being, of being without being, where everything just falls away. Everything falls away, it dissolves into subatomic particles for sight and sound are replaced with the comprehension of matter beyond human comprehension, beyond human understanding. I mean, we're all just dust and shadow. We're all just dust and shadow. I mean, death is just the shadow. Death is just the shadow that follows the body. 
you know, what do you say? What can you say to somebody that only has 30 hours to live? You say, I won't forget. I won't forget you. I want you to say, do you remember? Do you remember how much beauty we actually saw, that how much beauty we possessed? I mean, we wanted it all. We went for it, right? I mean, we went for it, right? I mean, the, every day we went for it. I mean, we knew what the score was. I mean, in the end, we fought. We fought, I mean, we fought with every fiber in our soul. We battled, the battles raged. There wasn't a day that we weren't in battle mode. And we knew who the enemy was. You gotta know who the enemy is. I mean, in the end, the enemy is always gonna win. In the end, the enemy is always gonna win. In the end, the enemy is always just death itself. It's always gonna win. It's always just one long life or death trip. It's always one long life or one life versus death trip. In the end, that's what we're fighting against. I mean, it's a battle to the bitter end against the killing machine and the merchants of death. You gotta fight for your life. You gotta fight to control your death. It's a fight to the bitter end. You gotta fight against the spiritually bereft and their soul-killing bullshit. And how do you fight against it when it's in the fucking air? When they've poisoned everything. When they've poisoned everything. They poison the water. They poison the food. They poison the air. They poison the ground. They poison you. They poisoned us. How do you fight against that? How do you fight against it? I mean, what do you say to somebody that only has 30 seconds to live? You say, you will be king. You will be king. For yours is the power and the glory, and this is your story. You'll be wearing a crown of invisibility, and nothing will stop you. Now you're free. That this is the moment you've been waiting for your whole life. You can just ride off into the sunset, both barrels blazing, laughing, like a lunatic, leaving everyone and everything behind. We're just dust and shadow. Death is just the shadow that follows the bike. You don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. You're free. I'm right here. I'm right here. Take my, just take my hand. I won't forget you. I won't forget. I won't forget. You're going to explode. You're not going to disappear. You're going to explode. You're going to transform. You're going to be like a dark knight just riding into the endless night. Don't fear the night. Don't fear. Embrace the endless night. Embrace that deep black velvet caress. Just go. Just, and if you want to go into the light, go into the light. Go into the light. You just got to let go. You got to let go and you got to go with it. I'm right here. I'm right here. Don't fight it anymore. There is nothing left to fight. You will be king. You will be king for yours is the power and the glory. And this is your story. You're going to be wearing a crown of invisibility. We managed to force our words into the mouth of the universe. Tales of sound and fury, madness and lust. And I don't know about you, but words mean everything to me. They meant everything to us. So don't be afraid. Just, we're just dust. We're just dust. We come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars. I won't forget you. I won't forget. I won't forget. I won't forget. I won't forget. Thank you. Just kidding. 
Thank you for coming.